Hey everyone, thank you for coming. I know it was a hard choice, very tough slot to choose from. My name is Vittorio, I work at Bloomberg, and today I'm going to talk about variant visitation using lambdas, specifically how we can implement it, and I'm going, I'm going step by step and see how we can abuse or use language features to achieve some sort of pattern matching syntax. So this is a little bit of choose your own adventure uh, talk. I have a lot of content that I want to cover, but depending on whether or not you're familiar with variant or overloading techniques, we can go a little bit faster or slower and see more interesting stuff at the end. So this is the overview. We're going to look at what, what a variant is very briefly and why it's useful. Then we're going to take a look at variant visitation, recursive variants, and then there's a little bit of extra content, which is minimizing syntactical overhead. And by that, I mean providing a user API, which is really clean, and that's harder than it looks, than it sounds. So how many people here are familiar with variants? That's great. So we're going to go very quickly through this, but just you know, to, to get started, I like to introduce variants by starting with struct and then enum class as a stepping stone. So what's a struct? Anyone? Come on, what is a struct? Is it password everything public? <laughs> <laughs> a more formal definition, maybe. Yeah, an aggregate of types. That's actually what I have on my slide. So if you want to be even more formal, you could say it's a product type. And it's basically an aggregation of types. And the number of possible states is the product of the, state, of the number of states of, a, of every single type inside the struct. So for example, point is an int and an int. What is an enum class? Sure. Yes, how can you express it uh, in terms of its semantics and behavior? Sum type then? It yeah, it's a sum type. In, a, in layman's terms, it's a choice between values. So you have a bunch of values, like a, I'm on a, when a model a traffic light, and it can be either red, yellow, or green. So only one of those at a specific point in time. So what is a variant then? Choice between types? Yes, it's a choice between types. And this is why I like this kind of uh, stepping stone model. Because an enum doesn't allow you to uh, introduce state with any specific enum value, but with a variant, you can have your own struct as one of the choices, and that struct can have arbitrary state. So in this case, I, would, I want to represent like the state of a kitchen oven, and I can say that it can be on with a specific temperature, or it can be off without any extra state. So I think of variant as a generalization of enum class that allows you to add additional information to each state. And that's really powerful. This is a very small table that basically also adds the type theory and functional programming terminology. I already covered that struct is a product type. And enum class and variants are choices, so they are some types. And we say some because the possible number of states is obtained by summing the states of every state of every type inside either the enum class or the variant. So if you're familiar with type safe tagged unions, you can see that they obviously are very similar to variants. But variants have some objective advantages such as requiring less boilerplate. They automatically deal with constructors, destructors, and assignment, and they immensely increase safety. And these are big claims, but I can show, I can verify them through a simple example. So let's define a shape, some type, which can either be a circle or a box. And we also want to define an area function that given a shape, it will calculate and return the surface area. So this means that we don't have any kind of polymorphic hierarchy, but we're storing everything inside a variant or a union. And the shape can be either a circle that has a radius or a box that has a width and a height. And the area function needs to check what kind of things is actually in the shape and perform a different calculation depending on the active alternative. So let's start with a traditional tag union first. So this is what you would do before variant was introduced or before you knew about the idea of some types. So you need some sort of enum class here that allows you to discriminate between circle and box. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this shape type. Then you need a struct called shape which contains a discriminator and a union of 
the types that you're interested in. So in this case, to represent the data of the circle, I just have a radius, and the data of the box, I just have a width and height, and I wrap everything in a union. So as you can see, we need these elements which are not really related to what we want to model. We need this boilerplate for the enum class, a struct for every alternative, and a union that wraps all the alternatives, and then another struct that's basically your interface and packages everything together nicely. And when we're actually calculating the area, the situation is even worse because the interface is fine, we just get a shape, but then we are forced to switch on the type of the shape and manually list out every possible case that uh, the shape can represent, and inside the behavior of our calculation, we need to go through this very horrible syntax here where we have to access the union, then the particular data structure that we're interested in, and then finally we can perform the computation. Additionally, at the end, we want to make sure that if in the future we add a new case, we don't forget updating the, the, the switch. So it is nice to have some sort of guard here that allow, prevents you from making mistakes. One thing I want to tell you is that when you see this link down here, you can click it and it will bring you to an online compiler which has the example and the required boilerplate that doesn't fit on the slide, so you can test it out and see the generated assembly at home. So, as I said, when visiting it, we need a switch with a case for an alternative, and we need to access the union, so there is syntactical boilerplate in that, and an unreachable guard at the end of the visitation. So if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to, to ask, by the way. Now let's see how a CD variant compares. So the first thing which is really amazing is that it fits on one slide. And this is all we need for the definition of the sum type. We just define the circle, define the box, and we say that shape is a type alias for a variant of circle and box. So this is really, really straightforward and no boilerplate. And when we want to, do, to check the area, what we do is we use something similar to the visitor pattern where we provide a type which can be invoked with all the alternatives of the variant, and depending on what we're invoking, we can perform a different operation, and we don't have to go through any union. We immediately get the type that we're in interested in. And to invoke this visitor, we use std visit, which is provided by the standard library. And if in the future you had a new type to this variant, this code will not compile, because std visit makes sure that the visitor you provide is exhaustive at compile time and will tell you if you're wrong, which is really great. So, defining a variant type is trivial. All you need to do is basically list the types that you want inside your variant. Visitation allows easy access to the current ac active alternative, so you don't have to go any, through any union or something like that. And the visitors are checked for you to be exhaustive, so it's safer. And this was a kind of a simple example, but there are a lot of structures that are elegantly modeled by variants. Some examples might be JSON, ASTs, state machines, and error handling. And I have some examples of those. So basically what JSON is, it's a discriminated union between an object, an array, a string, number, boolean, and null. So this is a perfect example of what an, a variant can model elegantly. And if you want to have a serialize and deserialize, then you just take the value, which is the variant, and in here you do some visitation which will recurse and correctly produce the JSON string or the object from the JSON string. Another example I really like is um, error handling. This is like having return codes on steroids because with the return code, you can also associate some data or some state which helps you understand what went wrong or gives you the result you were interested in. And in this case, let's assume we have an open file function that takes a path and returns this variant here, which I call file open result. And this result can either be success, file not found, and invalid permissions. And in the case of success, this is the only place where we can access the contents of the file. So as you can see, we have a type safe, um, type safe basically union that prevents us from accessing the contents if the file was never found or if we had invalid permissions. And we are forced to visit this ret return type of the function because uh, we, if, if, we, if we use the union, we would have the freedom to basically go and check every set of the union. But here, when we call std visit, we need to provide uh, a valid visitor for every type, basically, in order to have an exhaustive visitation. 
Sure, question. Why use a variant instead of visiting directly? Sorry? Why use a variant instead of visiting directly? Uh, so the question is, why use a variant instead of visiting directly? So what do you mean by that? In uh, so for your visitor, you need to pass in either a visitor object or labels or whatever. Yes. So why not pass those directly to open files so that it can handle errors directly instead of having to wrap it up in a variant? Yeah, that's a different kind of interface. I see your point. Uh, I think that it complicates the, the interface for the user. Usually what you want to do, instead of providing five or six continuations, is cleaner to return a variant, and then you might reuse the same logic multiple times for that variant. So you might have your visitor stored in one place, and you can reuse it multiple times when you open files. If you had to provide all the continuations in the interface, you would have to specify them all the time, and it might be three or four continuations. So you could do that. Uh, it's a different way of uh, making the interface for your function. Uh, we can talk about that later. There probably are advantages and disadvantages. So all the examples I've shown so far use std variant, which was standardized in C++ 17. But there are a lot of other implementations that are available today. Probably the most commonly known one is in Boost, and it's C++ 3 friendly. Then you have X variant, type safe variant by Jonathan, which is here at the conference. BDLB variant, which is the open source Bloomberg implementation and MPARC variant, which is by Michael Park, and he's here at the conference as well. And all these variant types uh, have slight differences between them. They might differ in their interface, in the way their, their default initialization works. They might or, not have, or might not have an empty state. They have different strategies of dealing with exceptions and different rules for duplicate types. Some of them allow them, some of them don't. But the good news are that in this talk, all the techniques that we're going to implement are applicable to any variant implementation. So they are independent of whatever variant you use. But for simplicity, we're going to keep using std variant. So I just want to show you real quickly, if you're not, if you're not used std variant before, uh, the interface that it provides. So this is really intuitive. You can construct a variant with any of these alternatives and with any other variant which has the same type, and you can do the same for assignment. So you could use it basically as, as any of those types. And the way you access the active alternative in a variant can be done either with get and get if. The first one requires an explicit template parameter, and if you, if you want to access int, but at that specific moment in time, the variant is holding something else, so you made a mistake, it will throw an exception. The other, the other function that's provided is get if, which still takes a, a template parameter, but if, it, if you are wrong, and this is not the currently active alternative, it will just return null pointer. Otherwise, it will return a pointer that's safe to the reference and access. So get t requires the user to be aware of the currently active alternative. And in case of error, you will throw an exception. So this should be used when you are sure that what you want to access is, is actually there in the variant. And get if is safer and it can be used where you, when you are not sure, but requires syntactical overhead and doesn't compose well because you need if else, if else, if else chains to handle the possible errors. And this is, these, are, these are reasons why the standard library provides std visit, which allows visitation. And that's a more powerful abstraction that allows you to safely uh, access the active alternative of a variant. So as a small recap, variants are some types that model a choice between types. They are safer and more expressive than unions. And there are a lot of structures that can be elegantly modeled with variants. And I would say it's a vocabulary type, even though it's, it's really a template. So a vocabulary template that was introduced in C++ 17. And by vocabulary, I mean this is something that you should be using in your interfaces, and you're encouraged to use as part of what you expose to the user. It should be common knowledge between all C++ developers. So any questions so far? Great. So let's cover variant visitation. So we'll first give a definition of visitation, then we'll cover what I call traditional, and finally we will implement our own Lambda-based visitation. So I like to think about visitation as an abstraction that allows you to access the currently active alternative in an exhaustive and expressive manner. 
And by that I mean that you are forced to provide uh, some behavior for all the types that the variant supports, and it's expressive because it doesn't doesn't work through a chain of if else. It's it's uh, it's a very elegant way of saying for these types performs these actions, and you are sure that it's safe and exhaustive at compile time. Traditional visitation is what you would do today without any extra library. So what you would do is you create some callable object which can be invoked with every possible variant alternative and then pass it to SED visit. And the most common way of doing that is simply defining a struct. So this is an example which is very trivial. Basically, we have this printer struct, which has an overload of the operator call for int, float, and double. And it just prints out the number with a suffix that's, um, that's related to the type. And you could use it by having some variant of int, float, and double, instantiating it with a float. And if you call a CD visit, with an instance of your struct and the variant, it will automatically find, figure out what type is in the variant and call the corresponding overload. So this will print 20F. This is basic variant usage. And you can extend this logic to multiple variants. So if, we, if you remember the variant between circle and box from before, which is the shape, you might call some, um, some collision resolver with both the same variants at the same time and what you get is a form of multiple dispatch that has to handle all possible combinations between the variants. So this is also a really powerful um, way of you know, handling, um, of implementing multiple dispatch without having to resort to uh, polymorphism or anything like that. And it's guaranteed to be exhaustive at compile time. This is great, but I feel like it has a lot of shortcomings. The most obvious one is that it's, it has a lot of syntactical overhead because you have to define a struct that, are, that does multiple operator overloads. So if you go back here, pretty much all of this is boilerplate. You just want to say, do this for int, do this for float, and do this for double. Also, it has a kind of lack of locality because you, you often can't uh, define the struct near to the visitation site, especially if it has like a template method. It cannot be defined inside a function. So you might have to jump up and down in your source code to figure out what the visitation logic is and what you're doing when you're visiting a variant. So can we do better? And to figure out if we can, I want to take some inspiration from Rust, and I hope you enjoyed the keynote as I did. And Rust has language-level variants and language-level pattern matching. So the keyword to define a variant in Rust is enum. And this is great because we know that now that variants are actually a generalization of enums. And the way it works, you give it a name, and then for every possible alternative, you provide an identifier for the alternative, and in the, in the parentheses, you define uh, the state of this alternative. So in this case, int tag is a name I invented, and I know that int tag holds a 32-bit int. The float tag holds 32-bit float, and the double tag a 64-bit float. Once I have that, I can use let v0, and let is basically the equivalent of const auto. And I can initialize a float tag with 2.0, 2 so this is a double basically. And this initializes a variant with this active alternative. Then I can use the match keyword on the variant and provide some handlers here that automatically match the alternative and the structure, the value inside the alternative, and if there is a match between what I'm trying to, basically what's in the variant, it's gonna call the corresponding expression by using this arrow syntax. So the thing I like about this, it's very, very concise and tells you exactly what's going to happen without any unnecessary boilerplate. If we want to look at it a little bit, a little bit more in depth, this is called a pattern, and you can have a decomposition here, which basically binds the value inside a pattern to a specific name so that can, you can use it in the expression. And on the right hand side, you just provide an action that will be performed if the pattern is matched. So if you compare it to C++, you can definitely see that there is a lot of overhead in terms of syntax. And I'm cheating here because between the definition of the struct and the usage of the variant, there could be a thousand lines of code. So it can be, it, it can be worse than what you see on the slide. 
So I want to take this pressure from Rust and I want to build something similar that we can use in C++. And the way I, I did that is by using lambdas as our branches for the visitation. So what we're going to do is provide some new lambda-based visitation facility, which uses a set of exhaustive lambda expressions but to visit the variants locally. It will have a pattern matching like syntax, and I want to try to minimize the syntactical boilerplate as possible and have zero runtime overhead. And this is what it looks like. So we define the variant as before, and we instantiate it. Then I have this match function that takes a bunch of variants, in this case only one, and then I have to provide a lambda for every type inside the variant, and what it's going to do is very obvious. It's just gonna pattern match on the, on the current active alternative and call the corresponding lambda. Sure. So, uh, so when you said zero runtime overhead, you're saying in comparison with, with the standard visitor pattern with the struct? Yes, so the question is when you say zero overhead, you are saying in comparison with SCD visit. And that's exactly the case. In fact, this is internally using a CD visit. It's just syntactic sugar. So if we compare again to Rust's match, you can see that they're pretty much the same thing. And what I like about this is that you just read left from right and you understand what's going on. I just want to match this thing and these are the patterns and expression that I want to provide. And it's the same for Rust. As a disclaimer, this is a very basic usage of the match keyword because you can do way more powerful stuff with it in Rust that you cannot replicate in C++. So before diving into how we're going to implement match, I want to show you an additional, additional example of something that you might write if you use this function. So let's assume you have a request which can result in either a payload or an error, could be a HTTP request. And the payload contains some data, and the error contains a string that tells you what went wrong. So you might want to make a request to a website, and then handle the payload and the error. And if you got a payload, you might want to make a request to another website with that, the data that you received from the first one, and again, handle the payload and the error. So if you had to do this with std visit, you would have to define the logic for this uh, error handling, and this one outside of where you're doing the visitation, well, in this case, you simply read it left from right and top to bottom, and you can see the control flow clearly, and I feel like it's way easier to follow when you're doing nested operations like this. And we can now dive into the implementation. So match will be a function that takes NV variants and returns another function that takes NF function objects. And I have this kind of like carried syntax because as you've seen before, SCD visit supports multiple variants to have multiple dispatch. So what I want to do is allow the users to provide multiple variants here and basically bind them and then provide a bunch of lambdas that can achieve the same effect as SCD visit. <coughs> In order to create a visitor from the function objects or lambdas that we pass here, we need to build an overload set out of them. And after we do that, we can simply call SCD visit with the variants and the newly built overload set, and it will do the visitation for us. So the first step is figuring out how to create an overload set. So is anyone familiar with this? Okay. So there are some people who are not familiar with this, so I'll try to cover this quite quickly. Uh, we can start by looking at non-member functions to get an idea of how we could overload arbitrary function objects. And as you can see, this is an overload of foo that takes a float and a char. And by calling foo with different types, we call different uh, functions in the overload set. And is there any way we can use this to generate an overload set? And I would say not really, because we immediately hit a roadblock, which is that we cannot define functions inside other functions. And what all, what all we want to do is basically visit variants locally, so this doesn't really help. When functions are not helpful, we usually look at function objects. And the way you have overloads in a function object is by providing multiple operator call overloads inside the definition of the function object. And then you can call it by instantiating it and using the parentheses syntax as always. So can we use this to generate an overload set? The first issue is solved because we can usually define structs inside other functions 
or lambdas. So this is fine. We can provide the functionality near to the visitation site. And most importantly, we can also compose them via inheritance. So if you have a full float struct that only accepts a float and a full char struct that only accepts a car, then if you use multiple inheritance to compose them inside a full struct and you expose the operator call of both base classes as part of the full struct, you achieve the same behavior as, as if you define the operator overloads inside foo. So as you can see, from smaller pieces, we can compose an overload set. So you might be thinking, why do we need the using declarations here? And the reason is that, that if you don't provide them, you will get a compilation error about ambiguity when you try to invoke foo. And the reason is basically that um, the call would be ambiguous because name resolution is performed before overload resolution and it, it doesn't really have knowledge that you're trying to bring these two operator calls into the same scope. So by using the using declaration, you are basically telling the compiler, yeah, I want to bring the operator calls from the base classes in the same scope. So we're on the right track. We know how to compose. We know that we can have them locally. So we need to generalize this pattern. And the way we do it in C++ is by using some template meta programming. So this is my first attempt. I created this overload set struct that takes a bunch of functions and I enter it from all the functions and then I say using operator call ellipses here to expand this de declaration. And then I can use it by instantiating it with foo float and foo char and I expect to get the same behavior. So will this work? Does it work for just regular functions that don't have an operator? Okay, so Jason's comment, it doesn't work for regular functions, and that's true, but uh, we are mostly interested in lambdas and function object. So it's not really what I'm trying to get to. So would this, would this work in C++ 17? Yes, this works perfectly in 17, because we, we got this new proposal accepted in the standard that allows you to expand the using declaration with the ellipsis operator. So this is literally all you need to write in 17 plus some perfect forwarding constructors in order to build an overload set. Unfortunately, this causes a compiler error in 14. And this is really bad because even though a CD variant is, seven, is only introduced in 17, there are many implementations of variant that are 14 or even 03 friendly, and we might want to use this uh, visitation technique on them. So I'm not pleased and I want to make this work in 14, and to do that, we need to jump through some hoops. So again, the problem is that basically this syntax is invalid because saying using something, comma, something else is an error before 17. It just doesn't support multiple things. So the problems are that really only one of the base classes of operator can be introduced into the scope of the overload set with the using keyword. So we cannot do it all at once, but we can do it one by one. And there is no way of generating all the declaration at once because we cannot use the ellipsis operator in 14. So how can we work around these limitations? Well, the first one actually gives us an int. If we can bring them one by one, then we should try to match the first base class and then the rest of the base classes. So this is what you could write. So you match the first base class, which remember is a lambda or a function object, and then the rest of them. And this is legal in 14. So you can say using the operator of the first one, and that's fine. But then we need to figure out what to do with the rest of the, of the lambdas. And this is basically a job for recursion because we're matching the head and we have a tail. So what we want to do is recurse and build the overload set from a recursive case and a base case. So the base case is extremely simple. It's just a specialization of the recursive case when we have only one lambda and we just expose its operator call. In, in the case where we have multiple lambdas, what we want to do is ex always expose the first operator and hinder it not from the pack of the remaining lambdas, but from another overload set that contains only the, the tail of our, of our pack. And then we can expose the operator call of that overload set. So this is the way we implement overload set in 14. If you think ab about the pack only having another lambda, so let's say we have A and B, this would resolve to overload set of B, 
which is the base case, but the base case exposes the operator, so what we're doing it is basically exposing both of them in the same scope. Is this clear? Okay. Great, now that we have this, we can simply try it out by having full float, full char, and we can build an overload set and study Custer that it does what we expect. This is really simple. So there is another issue. We want to do this mainly for lambda expressions, and unfortunately they are not default constructible, and we don't really want to do that. We want to perfect forward what the user is giving us to our overload set. So what we need to do is introduce a perfect forwarding constructor to our overload set. Is there any plan to make it default constructible? Uh, so the question is, is there any plan to make it default constructible? There is a proposal by Louis, I don't know if it's already submitted or in, it's being written, to make stateless lambdas, so captureless lambdas, default constructible. And that doesn't really help here, but it could be useful for other stuff in terms of metaprogramming and having uh, to avoid unnecessary boilerplate for lambdas. So the base case is quite trivial. What we do is have a template constructor that takes f by forwarding reference and forwards it into the base class. And note that we are not using tf ref ref here because it will be an R value reference in that case. Forwarding references only happen in the context of template argument deduction, so we need to introduce a new type name here. And the recursive case constructor is slightly more complicated because we still need to forward, perfect forward the first function inside the base class, but we also need to expand the rest of the functions and the rest of the lambdas in lockstep in order to initialize the base class, which is an overload set with the rest of the lambdas. So once we have this, we need only one other small piece of the puzzle, which is a function called overload, which will deduce the types of the lambdas that we pass for us and we'll forward them to the constructor in order to prevent the user having to write out the types of the function object that he wants to overload. And again, if you're not really familiar with, it, with perfect forwarding and forwarding reference template deduction rules, we need to remove reference t here because if the user is passing an L value to overload, it will be deduced as a t ref and we don't want to pass t ref to the overload set. We want to pass the actual type of the function object or lambda. Is it possible it could be const? Uh, the question is, is it possible that it could be const? Uh, yes, that is, that's a good point. We should probably also remove the, the const qualifier here. So maybe dk would be a better, better approach. So with everything in place, we can finally write the code below, which is basically auto o overload two lambdas, and we can static assert when we call the overload with a float, we get zero, and when we call it with a char, we get one. And note that static assert is allowed here because in C17, lambdas are implicitly constructed if possible. So this is completely unrelated, but it's a neat thing to know if you're not familiar with it. So this is really similar to what we want to achieve. We can basically list a bunch of lambdas and overload them. So let's go back to the original task now that we have an overload set. What we want to make the compiler accept is the syntax here, where we have the match function, bunch of lambda, bunch of variants, and then a bunch of lambdas that will perform the visitation. So let's implement it. So remember that it will take nv variants as a first function call, and then it will return another function that will take nf function objects, and these will be our lambdas. Therefore, by this definition, what we need is something that roughly looks like this, where we take a bunch of variants here, and then we return a lambda that takes a bunch of function objects. And then we, did, we need to do something in here. So thanks to overload set and std visit, the thing we have to put inside the body of the, of the second function that's, re that's returned when calling match is really, really simple because conceptually, this is our set of lambdas, so we just overload them by perfect forwarding them inside the overload function that we implemented, and then we called std visit on the newly created visitor by forwarding the variants that we captured early when invoking match. So is this clear to everyone? Finally, we can write match v0, 
bunch of lambdas, and this will compile and print 20F. And you can try it out on any of the online compilers here. So here's an example with multiple variants. And again, this is the circle and box example, where we have the shape, which is a variant within circle and box. What we want to do is basically simulate collision detection or resolution. So what we can do is say, S0 is a circle, S1 is a box, we match both of them at the same time, and then we provide a bunch of binary lambdas that basically have all the possible combinations between the variant alternatives. And in this case, since S0 is circle and S1 is box, the second lambda will be invoked. So we'll print out circle versus box. And one more example with nested variants. So let's assume you have some complicated control flow where you can have a, an error state and an okay state. The okay state can be an, an accept or a reject. The error state can be a formatting error or a timeout error. This is just random stuff that you could have in your uh, error handling code. And if you use match on a, on a nested variant like this response here, you can basically compose match by calling it inside the body of the lambdas you provide, and you get this kind of nice left to right, top to bottom control flow, which could be useful if you have complicated error handling condition. So as a recap, variant visitation in general works by invoking the overload matching the active alternative on some overloaded visitor function object. And you can use uh, inheritance and using declarations to create overloads of arbitrary function objects. Always remember that lambdas are just syntactic sugar function objects, so we can apply these things here to lambdas as well. And if you overload lambdas on the spot, you can reduce boilerplate and increase locality when you, when you visit variants. Sure, Jeff. Um, so will, the, will it be to check the compile time whether your supplied visitors um, can support the possible combinations of, uh, like if you have a, a, a visitor for, for two bytes, each of which is a variant, would you get all possible combinations? Will it check? Yeah, it so, so the question is, if you have like multiple variants, will it check a compile time that you are actually supporting all the possible combinations of the alternatives? And the answer, it, it, it depends on std visit. In this case, std visit does it for you, so I will give you a compilation error if you don't handle all the possible cases. But it wouldn't be too hard to basically implement it on top of std visit and check it in the match function by doing some logic. Uh, I have a library currently that's generalizing this pattern for a bunch of implementations, and I'll, ha I'll have the link on the slides later. And every implementation I've tried does this for you. So it's pretty much guaranteed that a good implementation of variant will check that your visitor is exhausted. And I want to mention that struct-based traditional visitation is still really useful because struct visitors, in contrast to this match syntax, can contain internal state and have a richer interface. They can be more easily reused and shared in a large code base. And they can also provide customization points. They might have some policy through a template parameter which your user might want to change. So my guideline is, if your visitation logic is simple and local, use lambda-based visitation. But if you need something more powerful or that needs to be reused, then by all means, just use a traditional struct and pay the price for some syntactical overhead. So match can be implemented in less than 40 well formatted lines of C++14 code. And if you use 17, it's even less. What's the catch? Why, why is this problematic? Well, the catch is, depends on recursive variants. And in, the, in part three, we're gonna cover what a recursive variant is, traditional recursive visitation, and lambda-based recursive visitation. And to achieve this, we're gonna use something for functional programming, which is called the Y combinator. So before I dive in, any questions on part two? Cool. So let's begin by defining our recursive variant. So a recursive variant is a variant which can contain itself and can be used to represent recursive structures. So if you think about a JSON object, a JSON object can be an array of basically itself or a map of string to JSON value. So it's, it's recursive. And uh, to, to have a simpler example than JSON, let's just model simple arithmetical expressions as a recursive variant. So you may think that five is an expression containing a number. Nine plus three is an expression containing a number plus an expression containing a number. 
and 1 min minus 3 plus 7 is the same thing with another layer of indirection. So if you ever worked on a toy compiler or AST matching, this should be familiar to you. And this is a possible grammar. So a number is just an int in the C++ world. An op, which stands for operation, is either plus or minus, and these are like empty tag structs. And an expert, it's either a number, so this is the base case, or a number followed by an operation and an expression, and this is the recursive case. So with this grammar in mind, this is what you would intuitively do to model the grammar in C++. So you just say that the number is an int, then operation can be plus or minus, so it's a variant of plus and minus. An expr is either a number or this recursive case here, so you just model it as a variant of a number and a tuple of number, op, op, and expr. The issue is that this code doesn't compile and tells you that expr was not according to the scope. And this, is, this seems weird, but if you actually think about what you're doing, the error becomes obvious because you're defining this tuple which contain expr before having a full declaration of expr. So the compiler can obviously, cannot obviously uh, resolve that. So the, the usual way of solving this issue in C++ is providing a forward declaration. And if we do that by having this struct expr and then defining the recursive case and then defining the original struct by uh, providing a data variant member, so it's like a wrapper for a variant that allows recursion, we fix the previous error, but we get another error. And it, tells us, and it tells us that we cannot use the incomplete type struct expr. This again is obvious because since we don't have any kind of indirection here, we're basically trying to build an infinite type and the recursion doesn't stop at compile time. So it will have an infinite size. So the issue to solve this, it's, sorry, the, the solution to solve this issue is introducing a layer of indirection. And this can be something as simple as unique pointer. And what this allows you to basically tell the compiler is that expr has fixed size, but you can allow recursion by using heap allocation. So this is the way you could define a recursive variant by using a unique pointer. And one extra thing that we need is some perfect following constructor that simplifies the usage as we have this new data member which is required in order to build this recursive wrapper. And all we do is take a bunch of objects by forwarding reference, and we forward everything to the variant. And this allows us to say something as simple as x per e from 5. So now that we have a definition of a recursive variant, let's try to instantiate our original expressions. So e0, which was simply 5, is trivial to convert to C++. 9 plus 3 requires you to allocate a recursive case that contains 9 plus and 3. And e2, which has an extra, uh, an extra node basically, requires you to allocate a recursive node that contains 1 minus a new recursive node that contains 3 plus 7. And this, uh, this is the way, uh, I mean, you could you can make this a lot nicer by adding syntactic sugar functions, but you, you cannot really get rid of the allocations unless you, you do something clever. So how can we visit recursive variants? Because this is the real issue. If you're doing traditional visitation, it's not really a problem because you still provide a struct with multiple operator overloads and you can refer to the struct itself in order to perform recursion. So let's assume we want to evaluate these expressions. What we can do is simply provide a struct evaluator that takes a number as the first overload and it just returns it. Otherwise, it takes um, the recursive case, which if you remember is a tuple of a number, operation, and again, a recursive case. And we can use structure bindings here to cleanly unpack the tuple into the left-hand side, operation, and right-hand side. Then we can invoke std visit on the evaluator itself, passing the data in the right-hand side. So this is basically the recursive expression. And what we can do is use match that we implemented early to make a nice switch on plus and minus and return either the sum or the subtraction of the left-hand side and the resolved rest of the expression. Is this clear to everybody? So if we try to use it, then we get the expected results. 
and you can try this out. Does the, does the Sorry. unique pointer mean that every node is, uh, <coughs> has the pointer in direction? So does unique pointer means that every node has a pointer in direction? Yes, it's basically required in order to allow you to build this chain of expressions. You, you can avoid it, you can probably use a pointer and then be clever with the way you allocate the storage for the recursive variant. And I also wanted to experiment with a small buffer optimization for variants, but I haven't played around with it yet. So that's something I want to do in the future. So this works, but again, it gives you the shortcomings that we've seen before, which are syntactical overhead, lack of vocality, and readability impact. And another thing that I really think it's, it's a problem is that you have this explicit nested visitation, and re it requires you to call a CD visit inside the visitation logic when you want to recurse. And if you think of in, in a more abstract and generic way, you're basically exposing the implementation of the variant you're using, a CD visit, in the logic where you do the visitation. So if you want to make your code generic and your visitor work with multiple variant types, this is a problem. You need a way to, um, to uh, abstract the visitation away. So before we look at how we're solving the big problems, we can make a very small improvement. And you might have noticed that every time we want to visit this thing, we need to specify the data member. And that's just an implementation detail on how we, um, we build the recursive wrapper. So we can avoid that by creating a new visit recursively wrapper that simply calls the data for us. And it's very simple. The, this is just 90% boilerplate to do perfect forwarding. What it does, it takes a visitor and a bunch of variants, and it visits the visitor by forwarding the variants accessing data for you. So this is just avoiding the user to specify dot data. This is nice because in the future you might want to use inheritance instead of composition to maybe represent the wrapper, so you only have to change this implementation detail here. And once we have this, the code is much cleaner. We have this visit recursively here, which is still explicit visitation, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't force you to say dot data. And even on the user side, what, it, it only needs to pass the variant without going into its members. So this is way cleaner. However, this doesn't address any of the major shortcomings that I mentioned. So what we really want to do is see if we can apply the lambda-based visitation for recursive types. So rem keep in mind this is a recursive type, which is an expert which wraps a data that has a number and a unique pointer to the recursive case. And intuitively, again, if I want to do something really simple, this should probably work, right? Because I'm saying I want to overload the base case here that just returns the number, and then I want to provide a lambda that takes the recursive case and does whatever we did in the, in the struct visitor. And here I'm saying visit recursively with this, which is the, the variable I'm setting to the overload. So intuitively this should work. Why doesn't it work? Sure. Referring to the lambda or the function you're defining inside it. Exactly. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to refer to something which I'm in the middle of defining, and the compiler doesn't even know the type until it's defined because it's auto. So it just tells me that I cannot use this before deduction of auto, which is really inconvenient. But the real issue is, is deeper. The problem is that the language doesn't allow you, doesn't allow you to refer to the current closure from a body of the lambda expression. And by that I mean that if, if you think about a lambda expression as syntactic sugar for a function object, you might see that something as simple as this lambda is roughly equivalent to an anonymous struct that has an int operator which, takes, um, which is implicitly const and returns zero. So this is basically syntactic sugar. But when you're inside a struct, you can refer to the current instance on the struct by using the this keyword. So when I'm inside a struct, this refers to the current instance of foo. But when I'm inside a lambda, this doesn't refer to the instance of the closure, it refers to the outer scope of the lambda, which is usually what you want, but if you want to recurse inside of a lambda, it prevents you from doing it because you have no way of referring to the current closure. 
you can only refer to the outer context. So there is this proposal here that got rejected, unfortunately. And in the notes, it had this idea for, um, for solving this issue by allowing the user to specify an identifier between the capture list and the parameter list, which could be anything. Like I'm using self here, but you could use anything else. And this, this, this identifier is basically the, this keyword for the closure. So you could, you could just simply say self, and it would refer to the lambda, and you could recursion it. Unfortunately, this got rejected, and we don't have this. So another thing we might do, and you've probably seen online, is using a std function. Because if you use a std function to define the lambda, the compiler knows the type, and it allows you to refer to the variable even before it's completely defined. Unfortunately, that requires a lot of runtime overhead, because a std function is not a lightweight abstraction. It's a typed erased wrapper that can support any kind of function object. And we're interested in building syntactic sugar that doesn't force uh, runtime overhead on your user. So let's try to find a solution which um, fulfills those requirements. So I have a factorial here that takes n and does the factorial calculation. And what I'm asking you is what can we put here to recurse that doesn't require extra runtime overhead and just works with lambda? One possible idea is binding fact to itself and passing it as one of the arguments to the lambda so that we can refer to it inside the body. And this is what it looks like. So I have this fact lambda here, which now is binary and takes an auto self argument. And I also need a trailing return type to help the compiler deduce what the final type that's going to be returned is. And the base case, the base case in, is unchanged, but in the recursive case, I can say self of self and then minus one, and I can refer to self because it's an argument. And when I invoke fact, I just invoke it by passing it to itself with the initial number, and, and this works. This, this circumvents the issue that you cannot refer to the current closure from the body itself by forcing the user to pass the lambda to itself, which is undesirable for the user, but it solves our issue without any runtime overhead. Is the so, tra trailing return type, is that like a mandatory thing? Or? So Jason uh, asks if, if the trailing return type is mandatory. Yes, it is mandatory. Uh, I couldn't find a way to have the, computer, the compiler deduce the return type of, uh, of a recursive lambda implemented this way. I'm not sure if there is a way, but I always needed a train return type, even if the base case was in the beginning. Sure. So, so you're not capturing, so the fact that you've got multiple copies is, is okay if it's not capturing, but it won't go inline, right? <coughs> passing in a reference to the function. So this will disallow any inline with that lambda, right? So the, the comment is, you are not capturing, you're basically copying the lambda inside itself, so it would disallow inlining of the lambda. That's not what I experienced when looking at the generated assembly. The compiler is usually able to inline this. And the reason is that since this is auto and it's not type erased, it can see into the definition. And even if it's recursive, it can usually do the right thing. I'm not sure if there are any cases where this is problematic. Regarding the copy, we're going to fix that because we don't usually want to copy. We want to refer. So the biggest problem I have with this is the syntactical overhead. And honestly, I don't really care about this because it's an implementation, but here we're forcing the user to pass the function it's invoking to itself. And this is horrible. We don't want our end user to do that. So there is this interesting thing called the Y combinator, which is commonly used in functional programming. And it is a higher order function that can be used to even implement recursion in languages that don't support it. And it turns out this is what we need to uh, generalize this pattern of passing a function to itself to enable recursion. So it's just an abstraction over that. Our final result will look like this. So when we're defining fact, we're, we're passing the lambda to this Y combinator adapter. We still need the self and the int trailing return type, but both in the implementation and in the user interface, we only say we only have to specify the function once. 
So the Y combinator is abstracting the idea of passing the lambda to itself for us. And that's really useful, because it's what we need. So you can think of it as a function template which accepts any function object f with arity n and returns a wrapper f prime around f that has arity n minus 1. So this is arity n, but it's returning something that only requires one argument. So the y combinator is reducing the arity for us and dealing with the recursion. And the arity gets decremented because one of the arguments will be bound to f prime itself. So it allows, it basically binds itself to itself. It's kind of weird, but it works. And this is how you implement it. It's so simple that it fits on one slide, even though you have to kind of think about it to understand how it works. So in short, what I'm doing is storing the, the original function object and, and initializing it by perfect, perfect forwarding here. And this is the interesting part. The operator call of the wrapper that gets returned by the Y combinator, so when we invoke Y combinator, we get back a wrapper, invokes the original function object with a reference to itself and by forwarding everything else. And this means that the self argument in the original function object will actually be a reference wrapper to the Y combinator and we can reuse it to call the function again without having to pass it explicitly. Sure. Uh, so you said you want to use a reference for the, the lambda, even though it's stateless, or is it sometimes F state? Is that the problem? So the, the, the question is, you want to use a reference for the lambda because sometimes it can have state? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like on the previous slide, you, you said that self was a reference, or should be a reference. Yes, so what I was trying to say is that even though we don't want, we don't want to force the user to, to do auto ref, because it will get complicated. Do they have to do const auto ref or auto ref ref? We want the user to have this very minimal syntax when defining recursive lambdas, but we want to prevent copying the lambda over and over because it might be a move only lambda or it might be stateful, so it might be expensive to copy. So the way I preserve this nice syntax but avoid copies is just by using a CD ref, which gives me a reference wrapper. So it's a question of convenience for the final user syntax when defining the recursive lambda. And that's pretty much it. The only thing we need is a Y combinator function that will return a wrapper by um, taking a forwarding reference, deducing the type correctly. Here I used the K, so it will get rid of the const, and forwarding it inside the wrapper. So this is just uh, you know, the usual make xxx function that deduces the template argument for you. And finally, this is a full example. We can try this out. It's even contextual friendly by default, and it just works. So now that we have this, we have the tools to build recursive lambda-based visitation. Because if you remember, the original issue was that we had no way of referring to the visitor inside the body of one of his branches. So if we, if we use Y Combinator to wrap it, then we can refer to it on the spot. So let's, let's dive into the implementation of recursive visitation. So again, we'll have local pattern matching like syntax. We want to have minimal syntactical boilerplate, and this is very hard, and no runtime overhead compared to a CD visit or compared to a struct which recurses. And we want to abstract the nested visitation behind the recurse call that hides the way we're doing the recursion. So it doesn't matter if you're gonna use a CD visit or boost apply visitor, it's gonna be hidden into this recurse argument. And I'll start with an example of the final syntax. So we have this expression here that is defined exactly as you've seen previously. And we have this new, this new match recursively function that takes the return type as an explicit argument because as you've seen before, we need a training return type and this is going to basically provide it to the Y combinator. Then it takes a bunch of variants and a bunch of lambdas which are our base cases and recursive cases. And instead of only providing the type of the alternatives, we also provide an auto here which can be ignored for the base cases, but used for the recursive cases. And this will be, will be uh, an argument that will be automatically passed by the match recursively function and will, be, uh, and will allow us 
to recurse by invoking it on the recursive case. So it's kind of tricky to, to explain, but if you look at the usage, it should be pretty intuitive. So what we do in the recursive case is unpack the tuple here, and RHS is the recursive expression. What we can do is match on the operator again, and when we do a sum, we simply say left-hand side plus recurse of the right-hand side, and this is automatically going to call the visitor again on the right-hand side. So this is the way I, I managed to abstract the idea of recursion and do it in place. So is the syntax clear to everybody? Okay. And you can create a visitor as well if you don't want to recurse to like match in place. You just want to create the visitor and store it for later. So I provide this also, also this make recursive visitor function, which just takes the lambdas, and then you can use it with visit recursively as an argument in order to start the visitation. So this is obviously a building block for match recursively. So this is where we'll start uh, figuring out how we can implement this. So make recursive visitor will accept a return type T as a template parameter. And again, I want to reiterate that deducing this, this return type is non-trivial. I spent hours on it and I couldn't find a way, but I'm open to suggestions. This C++ now is the best conference to prove the speaker wrong. So, and also we'll take any number of function objects, which are usually lambdas, as, in, as an input. And these will be the visitor branches or patterns. So yeah, this is the most basic thing we can start with. We have an explicit return argument that needs to be provided by the user, and then we take a bunch of lambdas as, uh, as for any reference. So it's important to understand that the signatures of the lambdas we're going to provide have arity n plus one, where n is the number of the variants so if you have multiple dispatch, the obviously need to take as much argument, arguments to, uh, to be able to handle the combinations. But we also have this extra plus one, which is the recurse function object that will be provided automatically and can be safely ignored in base cases, but used in recursive cases to call ourselves. So keep this in mind. And another thing that you need to keep in mind that we're going to use the visitor with visit recursively. So what we're going to do after defining a visitor is pass it to visit recursively with a variant or multiple variants in order to start the visitation. And visit recursively, if you remember, is just a wrapper around the city visit which, takes the, which abstracts away the access to the data member. So therefore, the function object that's going to be passed to visit recursively must have arity n, which is the number of variants, and the great thing is that Y combinator can be used both to reduce the arity from N plus one to N and also implement recursion for us. So it's going to adapt our signature to what we need and also gives us a way to recurse on the visitor. So this is what I meant in written out in code. What we're going to return is immediately a Y combinator of a generic lambda that takes a self and a bunch of arguments here and returns what the user specified. And the, when the user will attempt to use make recursive visitor, they won't have to provide the self argument. This will be provided by the Y combinator. And this is why I said that the arity will be decremented because that's what the Y combinator is doing. And to create a visitor out of the lambdas, we can safely reuse the overload function. And you might be concerned that there is an auto argument here, but it doesn't affect overall re resolution. So in this very simple example, if we have an int before a char, and we pass a char, it's correctly going to disambiguate to the char, even though we have an auto here. So overload resolution works perfectly, even if we have extra arguments before what we care about. And since we can overload the lambdas, all we need to say is O equals overload here, and I'm using the generalized capture syntax to just put it in the lambda. And these are the lambdas that the users provide to do the visitation. Okay, so the goal is to invoke O with the currently active variance alternatives. In the context of the lambda that we pass into Y combinator, 
So this lambda here, the argument pack excess exactly represents the currently active variant alternatives because the recursive visitor is going to be invoked through visit recursively, which is a wrapper for a CD visit. So what's going to happen when you call visit recursively on something that's a make recursive visitor object is that this self is going to be ignored and this excess argument pack is going to be the pack of the currently active variant alternatives that's provided by std visit. If we know that, then we can immediately call the overload with something magical here that we're going to check later because this is the recurse argument. But everything that's after the recurse is just the, the values that you expect when visiting. So we can simply forward those to the rest of the overload. Is everyone clear here? Okay, so the last missing piece is, is defining the recurse argument and passing it as the first, as the first argument of the, um, of the visitor branches that the user will provide. And this is basically what we want to do. The excess pack is everything after the recurse and we need to pass this recurse thing. So the usage is, is basically recurse and it allows you to invoke it with a, with a, with a variant, with a, with a rec recursive case of the variance. So what can we use to invoke recursive visitor with variance? We already have this functionality and it's visit recursively. So what we want to do is, is provide this lambda here, which captures self, which is the Y combinator of the whole thing, so it's the whole visitor, that takes a bunch of variants and invokes visit recursively on self, forwarding the variants as the arguments that will be provided to SCD visit. So this whole lambda here is what the user sees as the recurse argument. The user will invoke the recursive argument with a bunch of variants. And what we're doing is forwarding those variants with visit, to visit recursively by providing self as the visitor. And self is what was retrieved by using the Y combinator. And this is how we achieve recursion. So again, what we're pretty much doing is binding self as the first argument. That's pretty much what it's doing. And the variants are obtained from a recurse call and they are being forwarded to visit recursively. So conceptually, it's not that complicated, but in the, in the big picture, it's, it's hard to get your head around it the first time. And that's it. If we can, we can now try out make recursive visitor. And what we can do is have this evaluate here that uses recurse. And when we call visit recursively, it just works as expected. So the last missing facility is match recursively, which uh, basically does it in place for us, takes the variance and builds a recursive visitor and calls it. And if you remember how match was implemented, we had this overload here that built a visitor for us and then we called a CD visit. It's exactly the same thing, but instead of making a visitor, we make a recursive visitor. And instead of calling a CD visit, we call visit recursively. So this is all we need. It's the same as match where we have the variants and we bind them. And instead of having overload, we have make recursive visitor. And instead of having std visit, we have visit recursively. And this is all you need to provide in place recursive visitation. And obviously you also need the return argument here because the compiler cannot use it for you. And this is an example of how you would use it. You can directly stream it into SCDC out, for example, if you want to, and you just Provide a base case that ignores the recurse, recursive case that you've seen before, and it will evaluate this expression and stream it out to a CDC out. So we're done with the main content. And this is a recap. Variants can be used to elegantly model recursive structures, but you need a layer of indirection to keep the size of your variants fixed and to allow them to exist in your plus code. And traditional recursive variant visitation using a struct is trivial, but suffers from the syntactical overhead that you might or might not want. 
uh, so we would like to have lambda-based visitation. In order to do that, we need to solve this issue, which basically tells us that it's impossible to refer to the, to the current closure from the closure body itself. And in order to solve this issue, we can pass the lambda as one of its own arguments. And this doesn't introduce any unnecessary runtime or memory overhead compared to something like a CD function. And the y, order, the y combinator high order function is uh, an abstraction, a generalization over the idea of passing something to itself to enable recursion. So when visiting recursive variants with very simple or one-off logic that you don't have to reuse, by all means, just, just you can use the lambda-based approach. But as soon as you have something that's complicated and reusable, you should prefer the traditional approach and just give the struct a name, reuse it, and probably document it. Uh, I want to make clear that all the utilities that we covered in this talk can be harmoniously used together. You've seen match being used in the implementation of evaluator to switch over the operator. So if you think about the bigger picture, you might have some struct that is the recursive visitor, and inside the struct to handle some different cases, you might use match because it's simple to read. So mix and matching all these techniques can make your code easier to follow and safer and terse. Great, this is the end of part three. So any questions about recursive lambda-based visitation? Sure. Have you, have you done any like um, benchmarks to see how it compares to like some kind of traditional visitation, ASD visitation? Okay, the question is, have you done any benchmarks to see how it compares to any traditional implementation? So by traditional, I assume you mean with the struct, right? Uh, or? Well, like, uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with, with much other than maybe like plain Xeno when it visits the ASD or whatever. Oh, interesting, yeah. Uh, I honestly don't know how Clang Sema visits the ASD. I, I, they might actually use polymorphic hierarchies for this. Yeah, they, and yeah, and runtime type. Control. Type erasure, yeah. But, uh, 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 I can tell you for sure that I've, I've compared the code for basic recursive visitation, so nothing complicated between lambdas and struct, and the assembly generated by the GCC trunk was the same. So I don't know if that changes, uh, if the lambdas get more complicated or you have more of them, but the, the, the small tests I've done is the same assembly. So it should be zero cost abstraction. Theoretically, the compiler is able to inline everything to the original uh, idea of a struct. So we have 15 minutes, and I have an extra part here, which is me struggling to minimize the syntactical overhead of recursive visitation, and also trying to deduce lambda arity for generic lambdas. So, I have some articles about this, and in my latest article, I basically rambled about my frustration when trying to clean up the syntax uh, that's exposed to the user. And by that I mean, if, if, if you're like visiting a JSON, JSON variant, you have all these autos here which are unused, and I, I, it bothers me so much. I know it's not really a very big issue, but I don't wanna see this. I want the user to just say, uh, to just have unary lambdas for base cases and binary lambdas for recursive cases. So ideally, I would like the user to write this, which is clean and nice. Doesn't have any unnecessary auto here. So can we do it? Not really. <laughs> it's harder than it sounds. So my first attempt was trying to deduce the arity of the lambdas, and I wanted to assume that lambdas with arity n are base cases, and lambdas with arity n plus one are recursive cases, and only provide a recursive argument for the binary lambdas, basically. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in terms of unary and binary, but this can, can be applied to, obviously, uh, generic n arity. So the idea is basically to have an adapt function before doing the overload that will, will do nothing when, the when, when it's taking a binary lambda, so we'll just forward it past, and when it's taking a unary lambda, it will wrap it into a binary thing that just ignores the auto without having to expose it to the user. So if you see my implementation of adapt, I used its constexper. So if it's a recursive case, I will just move it further down the pipeline. Otherwise, I will call this adapt unary thing. And please note that this is, we'll get into this, this thing here. Just 
This is just the adaptation. And when I want to adapt a unary lambda, I need to switch on whether or not the lambda is overloaded. And by overloaded, I also mean a generic lambda. And you can implement this check here by just trying to get the address of the call operator of the, of the closure. And if you cannot do that, you spin it away and you know that the lambda is generic or it's an overload. So if the lambda is generic or, or it's an overloaded function object, what I can do is simply wrap it into this other lambda, which ignores the auto for me and just calls it by forwarding whatever. But if the lambda is not overloaded, I want to make sure that I get the type from the signature and I propagate it further into this wrapper because if I don't have the exact type here, if I have auto here, overloading will not work as before. I want to have the concrete type there so that when I finally overload everything, it will do the right thing. And retrieving the argument type, let's, let's keep it for later. So the biggest problem is, how can I know whether a lambda is binary or unary if I also need to deal with generic lambdas? So if it was not a generic lambda, we could, use some, we could do something like using template specialization to match the signature, and we match the arguments with a variadic template here, and we can just say this, we can just say that the arity is the size of this pack of the arguments here. And this seems simple, but it's unfortunately very complicated to handle all the possible cases, and this is why libraries such as Callable Traits by Barrett, which is here in the audience, are, are great and probably deal with this issue. And this was con conditionally accepted into Boost, and I hope that it's going to be part of it soon. And it also allows us to retrieve the type that we needed here for the, for the unary adaptation. So this is, this is applicable only for non-generic lambdas. As soon as we have a generic lambda, we cannot really do this specialization because we don't know what to match. We don't have any way to say uh, match an overload set. So if it's a generic lambda, one thing you could try to do is attempt to invoke it with a type that's implicitly convertible to anything else. So this any type struct here, which has a templated constexper implicit conversion operator to T, and you might try to use STDs invocable, which is a new type trait in 17, by passing the lambda and any type two times to basically, I'm basically asking the compiler, is TF invocable with two things that are implicitly convertible to anything? So once I have that, the initial results are promising because I can try to say, is binary on this unary lambda here and this one here, so this is non-generic and this is generic, and they both evaluate to the, to the result I expect. Then I can try to do the same with any combination of generic or non-generic lambdas. And they still evaluate to the result I expect. So this seems very promising, but things break pretty much immediately. As soon as you have something in the body of the lambda, which depends on the type of this auto argument here, and you try to static assert if it's binary, you, you, you won't get the, the wrong result. You won't get a friendly error. It will also give you, it will actually give you a compilation error that you cannot spin it upon. So this is horrible because you cannot switch or conditionally execute something on this behavior. The problem here is that any type doesn't have a method called foo, obviously. And you would expect the lambda to be not invocable with any type because it doesn't have the method, but the error, but the lambda is actually invocable because in the signature, there is nothing that constrains this auto x argument to have the foo method. The, the error occurs during instantiation of the lambda and there is no way for the compiler to roll back an instantiation and put it in a sphere friendly context. So once we reach this, this spot, we're, we're screwed. We cannot do anything about it. The solution to that is providing a spin friendly lambda. So what you do, you specify as part of the training return type, the signature that you require on X in order to make it uh, spin friendly. This prevents the hard error, but the static assert fails because now it's not invocable with any type because any type doesn't have foo. 
And also, most importantly, you don't want the user of a pattern matching library to annotate every lambda with a decal type like this. Not only this, but we have more problems with concepts and Sphene constraints. So this is the example I was just talking about. If you try is binary, it, it will silently evaluate to false, and even though it's binary. But if you have a concept and you place the concept here, you will have the same behavior because the concept uh, makes the lambdas Fine friendly on its own. So this is horrible because we get the wrong result. So the next step that I tried is using existing knowledge to uh, avoid returning wrong results. So we obviously know that the visitor is going to be used with a variant that has some alternatives. So how about instead of using this any type thing, we try using every alternative until we find one that can be used to call the lambda. So we know that a recursive case is going to look like this. We're going to have a recurse here and a tx. And we know that a recurse only needs to support invocation. So we only use recurse by calling it. And t will be one of the variant alternatives. Therefore, my idea is that we can check if invoking a lambda with some recurse placeholder and any of the alternatives is valid, then it's binary. That's my, that was my idea. So what you can do is you can build a recurse placeholder that simulates a recurse function object. So it just accepts anything and does nothing. And then you can write something like this, which is, is recursive case is a disjunction of all, the, all these tests on as it is invocable with every alternatives of the variant and this recurse placeholder. So I'm basically building up an is invocable for every alternative in the variant and getting the or. If any of them is invocable, then I will assume that the lambda is binary. <coughs> this approach works with concepts and Sphine. It will do the right thing because even though in your variant you might have something like int that doesn't support foo, it will try all the alternatives and eventually will find bar that supports foo, so this will return true. And the same applies when you provide a decal type here. But it still fails in what I refer to pathological cases. So if you have something really weird, like auto auto, then it will give you a hard error, which is non sphene friendly. So you may think that this never happens, but sometimes the user wants to provide a default case for your visitation, which is a fallback that catches everything. And if, if that happens in a recursive case, then they will get a hard error, which is like three terminals long, and it's not understandable. So it should be clear now that approaches revolving around is invocable might be fine, but they are never going to work perfectly. What I really want is function signature reflection. So I want, I want the compiler to tell me what the user put here. I don't want to deduce it using weird tricks. I just want to ask the compiler, please give me the arity of this thing and I don't care whether this is auto or int or whatever, just give me the arity. Unfortunately, the current proposals, such as the one with the dollar sign and the one with the more conventional template syntax, they don't support reflection on uh, function signatures. And I think that lambdas and function objects are not supported at all. So this is not yet possible with the current proposals. So the compiler failed me. So we will have human arity deduction. And this will uh, involves changing the user's syntax slightly and the caller, so the user that's doing the visitation, will have to separate the base cases and recursive cases for us. This is a compromise. I'm not happy with it, but this is <coughs> what the final syntax looks like. So make recursive visitor will now be a function that returns a function. In the first invocation, we pass all the base cases. And in the second invocation, we pass all the recursive cases. And only then we have uh, a complete visitor that can be used. And this is basically where we split the function calls and the, we rely on the user to do that for us correctly. Eventually, we will end up with two sets of lambdas. The first set will be all the base cases. The second set will be all the recursive cases. And we know that we have to adapt only the base cases prior to overloading. So when we have the first call with the base cases, we can return a new function that takes the recursive cases, and our overload will be 
the adaptation of the base cases so that we can provide that another argument that would be ignored, and then all the recursive cases. Please note that this is pseudocode and not forwarding and whatever. So this seems to work, but I still need to research if there is any gotcha that I missed before introducing it into my library. And this is a full example of JSON stringification in, in place. So this works and you can try it out on one box. And what I'm doing here is creating a recursive visitor, providing the base cases, which are null, bool, number, and string, and I'm returning the string equivalent. Then in the JSON array conversion, I have the recurse argument here, and I'm, I'm opening the square brackets and joining with a comma the result of mapping the vector, which is the array, with recurse. So this is map in the functional programming sense. I'm applying the recurse function to every argument of the vector and joining the result with a comma. In the case of an object, I'm wrapping everything in curly braces, joining a map map over the, the, the map that <coughs> represents the JSON object by passing this two key uh, functor, recurse, and a CD plus. And this is, what this is doing is adding the quotes to the map keys, recursing on the values, which can be arbitrary JSON values, and then concatenating the results of these two functions with plus. And this is being done for every pair inside the map. And once we do this, we can join them and we can uh, stringify JSON. So this is an example of where you don't really need any extra state unless you're pretty printing or you, need, you want to keep track of any possible errors during stringification or whatever. So this is a good candidate for uh, in-place recursive visitation. Okay, sure. Uh, <coughs> did you just omit the trailing return type on the recursive cases, or is it? Uh... It's here. Ah. So the question was, did you just omit the trailing return type? I wish. It's actually hidden as part of the recursive visitor call. And this is the end of the talk. Some resources. I, I wrote some articles about this whole ordeal and you can find them on my website. This is my work in progress library, which will generalize all of this, and it will provide that implementation independent interface that will work with any variant implementation and actually uh, in, um, basically deduce by looking at the includes with the new has includes C++ 417 feature, what kind of variants you support on your system. And it will also allow you to um, define recursive variants and optionals by providing a placeholder syntax. So you can visit variants optionals and define recursive variant optionals independently of the implementation you're using. And you can also mix and match implementation in the same project. And this is a proposal by David Sanko, which is here at the conference, and I think that this is the real solution. This proposal is about introducing pattern matching and language variants as part of the syntax of C++. So if we had that, we, didn't ha we wouldn't have to do all this crazy stuff that I've just shown you because I feel like any, any modern language, such as Rust, or any functional programming language, provides pattern matching because it has now become clear how useful it is to use some types for a variety of things. So this is something we need in the language, and I'm really hoping that this gets further down the standardization pipeline. That's it. Thank you very much for attending. Did, sure. Uh, did you try using placement unique and epi down on a uh, incomplete type in the recursive variant? Um, the question is, did you try t using placement new? Uh, I didn't try using placement new. I'm failing to see how how could that could be beneficial. Well, uh, so you you were using uh, unique pointers because you can't just use an incomplete type inside the recursive yes. variant. Yes. It's not only that, but if even if I don't use indirection, the size of the variant will be unbounded. You need some, some way of fixing the size, and using unique pointer is a good way of doing that. If, if, you just, if you just say, this is a variant of a base case and myself, then the compiler will basically expand it forever, right? So you need, you need indirection, you need something to prevent that infinite expansion. Oh. Cool. Any other question? Cool. That's it.